Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Adventure Chronicles and the creators of the upcoming Heroic Adventures RPG, the one and only Alex Lockhart. How are you doing today, man? Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for thank you for coming on. So, I guess I'll start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yes, yeah, so... Um, I... So my dad introduced me to role-playing games when I was a kid, and um, he started with the beginning of Dungeons and & Dragons, um, and then when I was, I think, 10, he introduced myself and my brother to it, and that was, after, that was right at the same time frame as the Lord of the Rings movies coming out. And as a 10-year-old, you're pretty... Um, uh, <laughs> a lot of things stick at, at around that age in terms of interest. So uh, both of those interests stuck for me. Um, the, um, the the world that I got to see on the big screen with Lord of the Rings, and then being able to kind of play through an alternative version of that um, uh, with family members that my uncle played as well. And so it was kind of a family thing for us. Um, and in addition to that, I loved coming up with ideas and, and thinking about, you know, different, um, I was always suggesting like ways that it could be better <laughs> even at that age and being young. And, um, and so that just kind of evolved into a lifelong passion for role playing. I kind of naturally stepped into my dad's shoes as the, as the game master, um, as when I, uh, became an adult. And so I've been a game master for now for 12 years or so um and yeah All right, that's that certainly makes sense um were you more were you more of a one system guy or did you jump around between systems over the years so we started with third edition at that time um and i also played hackmaster which is the system the rule system based upon the Knights of the Dinner Table mm -hmm. uh, comic book. So, and I really liked the Hackmaster system. I think there was a lot of things it did different. And then later on, when I actually got to go back to play First Edition, I realized that a lot of the things that it did was kind of inspired by First Edition. Um, whereas Third Edition onward of Dungeons and Dragons kind of seemed to go away from um, a lot of things, including like how the initiative worked and things like that. Um, Packmaster kind of had a developed initiative system that was really unique based upon a counting system and a speed of actions. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed that. It, I felt like it made everything more dynamic. I uh, played 4th edition, but 4th edition felt more like, like a skirmish miniature game to me. Fun in its own way, but a f not, not the type of role-playing game that I, I, I wanted to play so much, although <laughs> I inevitably spent a, long, a lot of time playing it anyway. And then 5th edition as well. And then I have a, I don't know, a handful of systems um, that I've played like one or two sessions of, or read the rule, rules to, um, and then had you know varying success getting a group to play consistently in other systems. But yeah, mostly uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and Hackmaster were the two uh, ones we played the most. It is funny that whenever 4th edition comes up, I always hear the whole skirmish miniatures thing, because, well, D&D &D is born from a miniature war game. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But... With, the, with, that, in, with that in mind, um, what, pro what prompted the creation of Heroic Adventures? Was it just a... Collection was it just you house ruling your way into built into building a game, or was there a different route? So it was 
uh, playing Hackmaster with its initiative system, it, the combat was very dynamic, and then also kind of the harsher rules in terms of um, recovering hit points and wounds, um, I felt like led naturally into a role playing because it puts you in situations where you had to choose do we pursue such and such an NPC or do we sit back and wait and and rest up? And so it allowed the game master to put the players in situations where they weren't just going to recover everything with a simple night's rest. They had to make tough decisions. And so I felt like those rules encouraged role playing. And then the initiative was very dynamic. Um, characters, uh, the combat was always shifting and moving. And it wasn't simply action. With the, My problem with 4th edition and 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons is I feel like all the the fun of the game is pre-scripted in the abilities you choose. Um, the actual core system, if you're just rolling a, the, the d20 for initiative and then a d20 on a turn against a static armor class, that is not a robust enough system to be enjoyable. And so the enjoyment comes from all of the abilities, but that's very pre-scripted. If you want to if you want to be someone who, if you want to make a unique character, there has to be a suite of abilities that that there, uh, of a certain character class that lets you do that. Um, instead of, and I kind of lean towards games where there is a kind of rich underlying system with with some abilities on top of it, which makes things unique. But that the underlying system itself is robust enough to actually stand up without having a bunch of content poured on top to give you things to do. So, I mean, the classic example of this, the best, of course, example of this is chess, right? Where you have, you know, a set of, a very simple set of rules, but that leads to, like, kind of flowering complexity in turn, and, and, like, you, there's always more to see. It always kind of is more than you think. And then there's a lot of games that kind of do that same thing, where just the underlying rules themselves present you with ways to make your character unique and do things differently without an ability that you had to choose that lets you do the thing. So with that in mind, I, I wanted... The, the problem, though, with Hackmaster, in my opinion, is the complexity and the overhead and the management. It doesn't have that streamlined feel that modern games have, particularly I'm thinking of board games, where it's almost like the rules of the game, when it's done well, disappear. Um, there's a lot of overhead and maintenance and tracking of numbers. And so I wanted both of those things. I wanted the that um, uh, dynamic initiative system plus um, that, that leads to all of this like interesting choices that you know that maybe even I don't think of, but then somebody does it and it's like, oh I didn't even think of doing that, like combining, you know, that weapon and that, you know, um, uh, you know, that stat those stats or whatever. But um, but then having it uh, streamlined to where the actual rules overhead is not really there. It kind of just um, melts away. And also utilizing components to the advantage of the game um, to where you don't have to, you know, track. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of tracking because the components themselves, and I use cards and, and, and Heroic Ventures as cards that help you, that have a lot of... Um, Kind of complexity built in, but you, as a player, you never know, you don't know that. But as the game designer, I've built in this like interesting complexity in the, how the cards come about. Um, but from a player, you're just looking at the number on the card and seeing if you get to go next or not. So, and that was the that that really was what started it. And then there was a bunch of other things on top of that that I kind of wanted to tweak and play with. Um, uh, but the initiative system was was a big piece of what I wanted because that static like I'm going to go on a cer certain initiative and then wait for, basically for everyone else to go before I get to go again of Dungeons and Dragons was just not doing it for me. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was just it has to be a better way than that. And as far as what you mentioned with with Hackmaster um, it's been a while since Hackmaster but from what I recall for one a lot of it was meant to be one giant parody <laughs> of AD&D. Yep. So it was def there was definitely them taking the piss. They just accidented their way into um a into a well into a good designed game. Then again, the greatest in the greatest inventions were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. 
Oh. Yeah. Well, and I think the the last latest version of Hackmaster, which is now I don't know, ten years old or so, but I think it was designed less to be a parody and more to be an actual game. However, there was there's a lot of intentional clunkiness in the game in the game, um, which gives it that feeling of like you got to look up you know things in the rule book, which is kind of fits into the the whole setting of Knights of the Dinner Table and everything. And so I understand why they did that. Um, but I think that uh, some, some of the inspiration was just being more creative with with some rules and, and, and also kind of looking back at some of the older stuff and taking inspiration from that. Um, uh, there, there was, like, you know, things I learned from that which, you know, opened my eyes to, you know, it doesn't have to be just, you know, you go and then... And then I wait for everyone else, or you know, wait for everyone else to go. That the thing. So it just started sparking ideas um, for me. Mm-hmm. Now, most of the the other thing to the other thing to note, especially especially going back to a lot of early games, is a lot of a lot of the fir- a lot of the first generation um, role playing games. We're drawing upon war games, and war games have never really had, uh, well, for the longest time, they ha- they didn't really have a unified system, but rather a series of subsystems, and that kind of carries over. Um, I don't know, I don't know when it shifted, but eventually it did to a unified, all roads lead to Rome kind of approach. Um. Yeah. So I actually play. Um... So, in terms of miniature games, I'll just kind of... I, I play miniature games, too, mm-hmm. and I'll I'll play what people are willing to play. <laughs> um, however, my preference is historical 15mm um, war games. Um, uh, and then also, um, in terms of board games, I like all the, you know... I, board games is open-ended, it's just like, I'll, I'll play whatever. But I, I do enjoy war games on the board gaming side as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting to see the different the differences like between the way that um, I don't know whether it's role playing games or miniature games or board games the different ways they developed over time um, and trying to bring uh, some of the creativity in uh, like say from role play, uh, from sorry from board games um, the the just like w- the willingness to try new mechanics and new things. Um, and then also that, that emphasis on streamlining the rules uh, to where, again, they kind of, the rules kind of get out of the way instead of uh, being in the way um, were other inspirations. So, with your, with your particular system, is, is the, is the particular Rome, the, I.e., the core mechanic still a um, a d a d twenty a d twenty versus um, target. Not exactly. It's a it's a opposed rolls uh, and they're d twelve rolls. So d, um, so d twelve oh, is the Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So d twelve opposed roll uh, on basically everything. There's um, uh, other than skill checks where there's a like established difficulty by the game master um, uh, then it's just a target number other than that everything's in a post roll mm-hmm. yeah but still d20 or sorry d12 plus modifier there's some reasons for the 12 um, I know it's the, tw- the d20 is kind of an important you know thing in a role playing but uh, yeah d12 plus a modifier post roll is um, yeah, will be pretty familiar to anyone who's played role playing games. Yeah. Well, i i have I have joked for the longest time that I want I want to do a adopt a D twelve um, cheesy cheesy PSA kind of thing. <laughs> I um. So <laughs> I, it's kind of a goofy thing to um, think about, but my favorite dice is the D twelve. Uh, uh, a tw- the twelve is a anti-prime number, 
So it's a number that has a lot of divisors, so two, three, four, six. Um, also, it's the largest dice that is um, not... So if you look at like a D6, the D6 and the D20... Um, the, or sorry, um, the, the D12 like lands well. So like a D4 is of course kind of clunky to roll. The D10 I always feel like is not... There's a lot of D10 based games, and I always feel like the D10 is um, just not as enjoyable to roll as the D20 because the D20 is like symmetrical and on all sides versus the D10, which has like the two sides of being symmetrical. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also a lower number, so you get more twelves. So you have some, you have more often like critical hits and things, um, and you can play off of that le that smaller number amount. You can kind of get more um, uh, exciting moments in. Instead of waiting on the twenty or doing like a nineteen and twenty thing, which is just a little less uh, a little less um, clean of a roll to have a nineteen and twenty versus just the highest number. Um, yeah, and then, but it still gives you enough numbers to use where it's like a d six. Where you know you don't, there's not many options on the d six. Like a plus, if you get a plus one on d six, it's a huge benefit. Um, and then also, honestly, numbers. Uh, I play uh, like the ha having the lower number. Um, I play a lot of with a lot of people who, who don't play a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're doing like a D20 plus, you know, uh, you know, uh, like eight or something, it just and then also <laughs> playing with my kids as well. It just having the lower number just makes the math a little easier and a little quicker, a little less mentally taxing. It for some people they might think that is just like the goofiest thing to say it's like it's it's pretty easy math but i don't know i think it, it matters to have um a six plus a three versus a 16 plus a you know i don't know nine or whatever but that's another reason just trying to keep the numbers lower um uh it, particularly as like you get higher levels and stuff yeah now you mentioned that you mentioned that Die, that die rolls are con, are going to be contested. Is that is that going to be case with all die rolls, or do you have a baseline for the GM to put in some sort of difficulty when they when they when um when an opposed roll wouldn't quite fit? Yeah. So um, the way I have it currently is that for actions that you're taking, it's like skill checks, basically, um, where there's no opponent then it's a static number that you have to beat. Um, uh, and then that's the that's the only case. In all other cases, um, it, it, you know, assuming that there's... Yeah, in, in all other cases, it's an opposed roll. Because if it's not, if there's... If there is some opponent, then they're rolling and adding their stat. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind... Uh, based on what I'm... Based on what I'm seeing... Would it be fair of me to say that you don't necessarily have a um, a skill system? Um, there, so there is a skill system. I don't think it was included in that, um, and and what I provided you to look at. Um, there is a skill system. I didn't. That's one area that I I didn't really do things differently there. Um, you basically can spend. Um, points in a uh, long list of um, skill options um, from, you know, lockpicking to sneaking to, you know, um, grappling, you know, so on. Um, and, you, yeah, you can spend uh, each level, at character creation, each level you can spend some points, you can increase those numbers, and then it's basically like whatever your core stat, whatever the core stat is for that action plus the points you spent in that action. So pretty standard Because I, the the close that I saw in what you sent me was a skill stat, which isn't exactly the same thing as as a skill system. Yes. Yeah. So that's so the stats are not the normal strength, dexterity, um, so on stats. Uh, it's a different set of stats. Um, so your core stats are skill and agility, which is basically skill is the and I'm. 
Yeah, so skill is your bonus to hit. Agility is your bonus to dodge, basically. Your defense bonus uh, roll. Um, and then Arcana and Willpower are the same, kind of the same thing. Um, Arcana being for mag you know, magic and spell attacks and things like that. And then Willpower being a lot of times used for, uh, is used against spell attacks, although spell attacks can attack different stats. Um, but then also uh, for Willpower, it kind of introduces a little bit of... Um, uh, you know, a character might be really tough in one situation, but vulnerable in another. So, for example, a, a, a situation that happened recently when we were playing was someone who was... Uh, he, he, I told him to try to break the game. You know, I told him, like, you know, just look for the cheesiest thing you can do, try to break the game. So he put everything in agility, right? So his agility was really high. He couldn't be hit by any of the, the monsters that were that were at kind of the roughly the the level that they were playing in. Um, but then zombies have a rule where if there's multiple of them attacking you, it's like a swarm effect where they they start attacking your willpower instead of your agility because you don't have the maneuver. You can't maneuver enough to use your agility, and so it becomes a willpower attack. Uh, and so that made him vulnerable in that situation. So that's an example of where, like, you know, the uh, there's a a lot of um, uh, weapons and um, uh, class abilities and spells and so on will target different stats. Um, like, for example, the rogue can target initiative instead of agility. You know, uh, and, thing, and you know, there's different different ways that that kind of plays in comes into play. But um, and the reason for not using this normal six stats is because what what I was seeing was that you you rolled your stats and, and then you would do a conversion into your combat stats right so you'd have your you know your strength or your you know whatever the stat was that affects your to hit roll and half master it's actually intelligence and Dungeons and Dragons it's strength so you'd have your core stats you would then have a modifier and then that modifier would then sometimes, like, you know, 15 is a plus 2 or whatever in Dungeons and & Dragons. And then that modifier then is affected by some other things, and then you finally get your bonus to hit. And I wanted to just streamline that down. Like, the thing that, that ends up mattering is, what's your bonus to hit? Um, and so making that the core stat... Um, streamlines character creation, keeps, keeps the game simple, which the game is designed to be... Again, uh, aspirationally, it's designed to be simple, yet with, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, hidden complexity. Um, I know, you know, anyone designing a game can say that that's what, you know, <laughs> that's what they want to do. But that, that's the, the goal is to keep this, the rules simple. Anyone can start playing, but then there's things to discover um, in the system. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was the reason for having those stats, and, and that's where that skill comes in. Although calling it skill throws a lot of people off because they're expecting it to be a, like a skill, like um, you know, you're like a skill check or something when it's actually a core stat, which is your to hit bonus. I look at that. So as the naming of is old, a little problem. I look at that as more of old habits, and ironically enough, a well skill issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, if on, if only because I've um I've run I. I do I do a lot of game I do a lot of games um that are one shots at my LGS especially around free RPG day and I can always I can always tell when some when somebody is one of those one system lifers because they because they will try and f they will try and force the game that I'm running to work to work within the to work within the game the only game that they know instead of Approaching things with a blank slate, um, which is which is ironic. Which is ironic, given that if I was doing a board game, they wouldn't ha they wouldn't have that approach. But I digress. Um, one of the big examples was when I was running um, Earth Dawn, and then one guy jumps in. One guy, as we're doing prep, says, "Okay, who's going who's going to be the tank?" <laughs> That's not how Earth Dawn works. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, but, and 
everybody everybody just looks at him like he, like he had turds hanging out of his out of his mouth for about 5 seconds before he just moved on yeah definitely um there are some uh yeah the 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 blank slate thing is important Particularly, i mean i think anytime you're playing a game you haven't played before if the more you come at it with a blank slate i think the more you'll get out of the game mm -hmm. um well, I've, so, I've said before, my my best students are ones who have more of a more of a, um, if anything, a video game background, which I know mm. is blasphemous to some, but <laughs> in my ex in my experience, um, the ones that have the ones that have that background don't 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 get weighed down by preconceptions, as it were. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think that definitely applies. And like another example would be, and this you asked earlier about uh, one of the motivations for the game. And another one is every time I in Dungeons and Dragons, you, you equip armor, and then the armor makes you harder to hit. <laughs> and I like there's a part of me that just kind of cringes a little bit every time. It just seems so counterintuitive to say like the increased armor makes you harder to hit, um, and then not and then not having like a toughness mechanism. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's it's uh so so yeah, there, and her adventures is a y you can be hit, but then you have toughness which reduces damage, and that just at one extra dimension of like analysis opens the door to possibilities. Right, you can be hard to hit but easy to wound, or you know. Uh, easy to hit but hard to wound, and that that at least adds again to that underlying rule system, some uh, some dynamics to, and some things to choose from. You, you, are you going to be balanced, or are you going to focus on one? And then um, you know you you could be going a long time without any you know sustaining any damage, and then all of a sudden you you go from you know being in the clear to like hurting real bad. Um, versus being withered away slowly. So uh, uh, some of those additional things uh, certainly would be counterintuitive to some, uh, but adds a lot of uh, com interesting choices uh, during character creation and then also during combat and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of character creation, that brings me to to some to um, something that I wanted to bring up. That's br that's brought up in both. The ra the racial example as well as the class example, and that is, um, her that is heroic features. Yes. Now, the classes, both the races and the classes, have heroic features and they have legendary features. And yep. I think what I'd want to get at is: is it a case where you're, where you're getting the whole? Where you're getting the whole thing of it all, all at once as as a package, um, and if and if so, how do you have it? How, how do you have advancement work? I know that there's the plus three plus three health for human and plus two health for for fighter, but what I'm curious about is what is what you'd end up getting out of the gate from your choice of race and class, and what you get from yeah. advancement. And I'm I'm not yep. even I'm not even operating under the assumption that you're using levels. I haven't seen anything that says that says yeah. you would. Yes, there are. So there's levels. Um, and yeah, advance. There's okay. So let me um, kind of take a step, a uh, quick step back. So with the initiative system, what happens is you you have a, your core initiative is a core stat. Um. So you might have initiative three or one or five, depending upon you know your character class and race and um, the choices you made during character creation. So you have a core stat, um, and then uh, your weapon will dramatically change that. So a dagger, so the extreme examples is a dagger is plus four initiative, and a great axe is minus four. So uh, presumably, if you had a great axe, you're going to be like a one initiative, unless unless somehow you you know. Uh, bumped up your initiative other ways um, really high. Um, and then if you have a dagger, you're going to have a really high initiative. Now, uh, and by high, I mean 
the maximum would be like 15 um would be the the maximum possible um and the lower initiative numbers get two cards in the deck so you get two actions per round and then as you get higher initiative you get three or four actions um and four is the, the higher initiatives have four and that's the most cards in the deck um and when your card comes up you can take an action it could be a minor action which is like a small like, a, like moving two spaces for example would be a minor action dwarves uh move one space not a minor action um I, I think it's the hunter that moves three or something, but so I can change. And then some characters have, uh, well, and getting into the advancement. But before I get to that, then you have you can take one major action. Uh, so uh, it could be the first time your card comes up, or the second time, or the third time. You get one major action, and that's your mo normal movement of like six spaces or something, and then you're attacked. Now that's pretty basic. It's literally just wait for your card to flip up, and then when you, your card comes up, you get to take an action. On top of that, if your uh, each initiative has a bonus card in the deck, and if your bonus card comes up and the previous initiative was lower than yours, you get to make another attempt. And what that ends up meaning, and and so playing the game, it's it's very simple. Like I've never had any issues explaining it. Once I once the cards start flipping up, it's very obvious to see like, oh, I get a bonus attack now because the previous card was a four and mine's a six, and it, you know, so it's really easy to play. Um, uh, with built within that, the, the the numbers of the cards and how they're uh, how the deck comes together, whichever character has the highest initiative in the encounter is going to get roughly eighty percent extra, uh, eighty percent um, more attack. So instead of one attack, they're going to get rough, say roughly two attacks, about double the attacks. And then whoever has the lowest initiative is going to get basically one attack every round instead of the highest one being two. And that changes depending if, if you, you might be an eight initiative and be the highest in the encounter, you're getting double attacks. But then you walk into a different encounter with higher level monsters or something or uh, characters that have higher initiative and you might be the lowest now. And that means you get one attack and they get multiple. But all of that math, like, I, I, I'm an engineer and uh, with an <laughs> emphasis on math. So I, I do math, but all of that math is hidden. Like the players and even the game master know nothing of that. They're just looking at the cards and taking actions when their card comes up. But behind the scenes, higher initiative means more attacks. Lower initiative means less attacks. Mm -hmm. um, now the advancement comes into play. Basically, uh, you can have a heroic action, which is just an action that you can take once per encounter. Well, we're, I'm playing with th these rules a little bit, but Basically, a heroic action would be like a once per encounter ability, um, and then when, so when you advance in level at level one, you get to choose one heroic uh, or one yeah one um, heroic feature, which might be a like a heroic action, but it doesn't have to be. So, for example, the soldier class has a lot of minor actions. So instead of having big attacks and big abilities like the fighter or the barbarian. The soldier has these minor actions, which means he can use them all the time without any limitation as his cards come up. But, and they're small things like movements, giving bonuses to hit depending on the situation. So, um, so yeah, some character classes and races focus on minor actions. Some focus on the heroic actions. And choosing, you basically get one of those per level, um, one of those features per level. Um, and then some of the features are static. They're not an action you take, it's just a static change to your character. So those are some of the simpler classes to play where you don't have all these actions to pick from. It's like just static changes to your, your character stats and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I think the, the bigger question is, that, is then, what's going to separate heroic actions from legendary actions? Okay, so the legendary actions are basically available at level 6. Um, on so the game has ten levels of advancement one through five. At one through five, you're picking heroic actions or heroic features, sorry, and then six through ten, you're picking legendary features. So it's just like um, higher tier versions of the heroic ones, or it's new ones that weren't available, like totally new abilities that weren't weren't available at the lower level range, um, and uh, and those legendary features replace your heroic features. Um, 
which accomplishes two things. One being that it prevents that like just complexity creep as you go and advance in level, you just get access to so many different things, um, making the game complex. It, so it limits that to a degree. Where as you go up in levels, it doesn't it doesn't um, dramatically increase in complexity. You got more choices. You have more things to, that you can do, uh, but it's not dramatically so. Um, and then the second thing is it keeps the character sheet to a single page, which is one of the kind of like bullet points. The first one of the first bullet points I wrote down way years back when I started was one character sheet, uh, front and back, nothing beyond that. Um, uh, uh, just, to, you know, one thing being the just uh, ease of um, playing the game, not having lots of paper all over the place and stuff, and then also to just emphasize that the game is designed to be uh, easy to play and simple with depth, and that holds true at high levels as well. It doesn't. It's not simple at level one and really hard and complex at level ten. It's still uh, fairly streamlined at level ten as well. So, given given that, how how do you maintain that simplicity when it comes to magic? Because that's always where things get tricky. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, certainly playing magic uh, using classes is going to be. Um, a bit more complicated um, than some of the others. Uh, but with the magic, you... So one of the things I'll say about the magic um, is that every spell uh, costs one mana to cast and then has enhan uh, enhancements to you can um, boost it with, with by spending additional mana. So like every spell, like when you're choosing spells during character creation and leveling up and stuff and all that, every spell has a like has the one mana cost version, and then like a level one, uh, a level one character can spend one additional point of mana on a spell cast to enhance it in some way, and then uh, as you go up in level, you get you can spend more. So level four, you'd spend you could spend four mana, um, and that first of all keeps a lot of options open in terms of. Um, you know, you're not limited to like five spells here, and then you know, five spells at a higher level. You have access. You can kind of, you know, you can create lots of different wizards, and each wizard would be quite different from each other depending on what spells you took. Um, and in terms of keeping the simplicity, um, it would this this the spell casting is pretty straightforward. It it uses uh, the most common. Would be an uh, carnivorous will, uh, willpower attack, um, uh, but then of course there are spells that kind of do complex and interesting things. One example being a time warp spell, which lets you put cards back on the deck, um, uh, and and then there's you know other other uh, other spells and effects that kind of play off of the cards, the initiative cards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now. With that, in, with that in mind, uh, is it a would it be a case where, where um, when, where upon le upon um, I guess upon I guess upon leveling is is it a case where you're go where you're going to be focusing mainly on the class that you pick from, or do you have plans on um, addressing multi classing? So. Currently, there is. I don't have any multi-classing plans, um, and so the classes. One thing I'll emphasize is the class is not. There's a lot to the character beyond the class in terms of. So, for example, the race uh, races give you abilities as well, um, in, uh, in addition to the classes. So at level three, you get a racial ability instead of a class ability. Um, so the race is. Quite important to your overall character. Also, the items um, give you abil uh, different abilities. Uh, normally, the uh, items are bonus actions. So, when that initiative card comes up and you get a bonus action, a lot of items have a special thing that they do on bonus actions. Um, and so, the classes are more focused on heroic actions that are those one-time use things, 
and then the items are normally focused on the bonus actions. But mm -hmm. um, so your choice of equipment and race and class all kind of come together to create your, you, you know, what your character can do, and each one is pretty equivalent um, to in terms of its overall impact on your character. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm just like not answering the question, but no, <laughs> like, no, I don't. I don't have plans for multiclassing. It's very hard to do that and not have unexpected things that break the game, like in terms of combinations and stuff that can uh, come in. So it's simpler to to not have that. Um, I, I don't. I uh, you certainly could do that, and I don't think you would. You you might find some edge case where things get wonky. Uh, if you combine two classes in the wrong way or something, but it, the the rules don't strictly prohibit it in terms of like it, structurally it would work. But yeah, I don't have any rules in the book for that. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Oh, because there's there's there are there are a few advanced classes that I'd be curious how you would differentiate them from the base classes, and one of them is um is fighter versus um, soldier. Yeah. Yeah, so the the fighter um, has a lot of the kind of expected things. Um, uh, abilities to use for attacking. They're, you know, strong in combat and everything. Um, the, the soldier, the, the thing with the soldier is all of the soldier's abilities are minor actions. So they don't have any. Uh, the soldier does not have any, like big ability or anything like that that it, that they can do. Instead, they have all these minor actions, and those and their minor actions are designed to be coordinated with their their uh, playing group, uh, with the group that they're in. So, like for example, some of their minor actions um, can do things if they if someone else is in a certain position relative to the monster or something. So it's des the the soldier is designed to encourage this kind of like tactical combat, with small adjustments throughout the combat with these minor actions that give them strategic advantage. Um, that was kind of the vision of the soldier and how it differentiates from the fighter, who, you know, can obviously also coordinate with his allies, but is um, has a lot you know has more of these just attack focused abilities and stuff or defensive abilities too, but. Um, not so much emphasis on that t tactical element. All, all right, and in in the same vein, I'd I'd be curious where the rune caster fits in, fits yeah. into these kind of things, since runic work is one of those things where there's a lot of ways you could do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there's. Uh, arcane spells, rune spells, nature spells, and then divine spells. The rune caster is basically the class that uh, gets access to the rune spells, and uh, along with the dwarf and the gnome, can at higher levels access rune spells as well. Um, uh, so the biggest differentiating factor with the rune caster is simply that he can access the rune spells, and the other classes can't. And the rune spells themselves are unique in a lot of ways because they, they're more utility spells um, and, and uh, things along those lines rather than direct attack spells. And so the spells in general are just going to be just play differently than, you know, uh, lightning bolts and fireballs and stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, so I think that's what kind of differentiates them. There's also a lot of uh, like the, a lot of the rune spells will drop things on the battlefield um, that then can be consumed like when you're attacked, but you have to be next to it, right? Um, it's like a like a like a rune that's being you know that's like is a kind of a little tactical element. It, it fills up a space in the in the in the encounter and uh, offers some tactical advantage to being next to it or to um, uh, uh, oh, and on the flip side of getting the enemy away from, if they placed runes, getting the enemy away from them so that you can get uh, prevent them from getting the advantage or block their path to it. So it just provides some kind of uh, 
um, ge geometric strategy, so to speak, on on the plate on the, on the on the board. So you're when you're moving, when you have the option to move, there's a reason to move two spaces because two spaces away is a better spot to be in right now. Um, so it kind of provides some of those choices and keeps the comment moving and flowing. And the rune spells kind of do a lot of that. I can, I can, I can certainly get that. And I'm guessing, um, I'm guessing the guardian class is all is all about maximizing defense. Yes, yes, and protecting, um, uh, protecting allies. Um, so, and the guardian is, and some of these like other classes are designed to that I, I label those other ones basic because. Um, they have a kind of a fairly balanced play style, whereas some of the other classes kind of have very, very focused play styles. And so, like for example, with the guardian, the guardian is very limited on how much, um, how aggressive and how much attack the, the, their attacks are quite limited in comparison to the other classes. Um, and they have a lot of abilities that can help protect um, their allies. Um, and then uh, also sacrifice themselves to protect their allies. So they have an ability where they can reduce themselves to zero hit points, give their hit points to their allies, um, and then but then they can come back as like a spirit. And like it's kind of like a, a, a the kind of theme behind it is this like spiritual guardian of certain of this like group of people. Mm -hmm. Now with that, with that in mind, you since you mentioned that um, that MP that essentially essentially MP or spell points, I just go I just go with MP just for the sake of my sanity with these things. Uh, is what's going to determine spe um, spell use? Mm -hmm. Is it a case where the, where there's a certain um, stat that's going to determine how much MP you you get, and if so, is that varied based on the choice of class? Yeah, so um, it does vary based on choice of class, particularly because some of the other classes, of, uh, like outside the wizard, do things a little differently. So the wizard, yes, ar uh, the Arcana core stat um, is what determines, is part of what determines the, the how much mana the wizard has. Um, and then some of the other classes follow that kind of pattern, um, but some of them don't. So, for example, the the Warlock spins health as mana. Um, and then, um, yeah, so some of them kind of, some of those other classes kind of take the core, like Arcana, and then mana kind of format, and then put a twist on it. One thing that's all one thing that's always a bit of a concern of mine is having is whenever games have it where the casting classes end up out end up for lack of a better term outclassing everyone else. Yeah. Um, the bit third edition and Pathfinder have been my whipping boy because of what I call what I refer to as Godzilla. I.e., cleric or druid, because somebody who knows what they're doing with either of those classes is, is an entire party by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the um uh, the way I've kind of addressed that because yeah that's a important thing to address. Um, one thing is that the mana is limited and the and, and that kind of goes into the theme of the game, which is that this is not it's not like you know. Every round, the the wizard just shoots a, a spell off every time, like every round. Like that's all. Like you know, um, when they choose to use a spell, it's impactful. It matters, but, but it's a drain on party resources. Basically, you could look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, you know, the wizard's going to have to find other ways to be involved outside of just casting spells because they're not going to be able to cast a spell just every round. Um, so I know some people, like you know, that's a take it for what it is kind of thing, because some people like it when the spellcasters are just always doing spells. Like, they don't need to go whack something with a staff or a shoot a crossbow. Like, they just always have a spell. 
that's not really what this is. This is more like the spells are big moments that matter. Um, and so they can kind of take over an encounter. And I've seen that happen a few times where it's like, okay, this is a bad situation. The play and the players are like, they've intentionally reserved the use of the spell casting. Uh, and then they just unload it and the, the spellcaster kind of takes over that encounter. But as a game master, it's important to then say, okay, you took over that encounter, but you don't get to just go back and rest up and, and then just go at your own pace here because you know they're coming after you too. So, so then you press them after the resources are drained and now it's someone else's turn to shine. Um, so that's one way is just the limitation on the number, on how much spells that can be cast. Um, the second one is the um, uh, there are ward runes, which something we haven't talked about yet is uh, an alternative currency outside of just coin, which is ether. Um, and with that, you can purchase uh, ward runes, which are basically spell defense, um, which is another way to kind of particularly for the players, it's something that they can spend to protect themselves against the spellcasters. And if they don't do that, then as the game master, that's a vulnerability that I can kind of exploit, and that kind of creates some dynamic and some tension with the player's choices and stuff. Um, but on the flip side, as a game master, if a character is very powerful, I can kind of use the ward runes more um, to my advantage, to the advantage of the monsters, just to keep things balanced. And so it just it's an easy way to kind of self balance the game because if you know if one character if the wizard is just doing too much too often, uh, first of all, force them to spend the spell, the mana, and then um, and then follow up with you know more action that they might not have choice over. That's kind of just a game mastering technique. But then the second thing is mechanical, which is the ward runes offer ways to kind of balance that. Mm. That um, yeah. Yeah, I can get, I can certainly get behind that. So. With that, with that in mind, when it comes to when when it comes when it comes to the book, it's when it comes to the book itself. Um, mm -hmm. Some game some games will go with a um, pastiche fantasy approach, and some games will build their will build their own setting within the book within their book. Um, where do you where do you lean on that? Do you have a setting plan that you're going to be including in the heroic adventures book? Um, I'll, I'm going to throw some things in just to give it some fluff material in there, offer you know um, a starting point for a setting with some of the additional material in, in the book along this along those lines. Certainly, nothing in the rules or the book requires you to use that setting. It's you know it's very much just it's optional and it's there, um, uh, and it's not going to be a lot. I do have some thoughts about, you know, future, you know, potential like a campaign book or something or a setting book, uh, you know, but that's that's not for now. So that's a future possibility. So th it'll be dribbled throughout the book, so to speak, but um, it's not going to be a ton, uh, and it will, uh, and it's certainly not required that you use it. Um, I have a setting that I've kind of put together over the last like ten years or so. I've, everything I've, I, I try to like. Every time I go to a new to do a new thing, I try to build upon that, you know. And I actually have two novels in that setting as well. Um, uh, uh, so the setting is fairly well established because I I spent four years of my life writing *The Call in the Wind* and *The Betrayal of Lords*. So that was before I decided to make a rule system. But um, so I'm going to dribble some of that out throughout the book, but it's not going to be a lot. Mm -hmm. And how much are you shooting for as far as a a um, page count for the full book? Yeah, so right now I'm at let's see here I'm at um at 207. I think that'll probably increase to probably 260. I think hmm. somewhere around 260. I think is where it's going to land at. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. And with and um, what what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a um, gen a general ballpark. 
Yeah, so the the game's on Kickstarter now. Uh, so the Kickstarter is live, and then it finishes um, uh, later this month. Um, 21 days left. And then the fulfillment time is January. So... And I will certainly be looking forward to that. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, obviously, I love to talk about it, and it's nice to uh, nice to meet you um, and talk to you. Yep. So. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.